Hello everybody, my name is Amanda Zitto, and a little over a year ago, I made a video about five lessons that I learned from the road while I was on the pilgrimage. And a little while ago, I also did a collab with Tim over on 40 Times Around about five lessons we both learned the hard way on the road. Links to both of those videos are down in the description if you'd like to check them out. The point of this video is that Rick left me a nice comment on my five lessons that I learned from the pilgrimage saying that it would be interesting if I did a video like this every once in a while as kind of a retrospective. So we're doing the thing, five more lessons from the road. Lesson number one, get some awesome roadside assistance. It will definitely pay for itself. The fact of the matter is, is that we ride motorcycles. Unexpected breakdowns are just a part of the game, whether you're super on top of your maintenance or not. Nobody does T-clocks every single time that they get on their bike, especially when you're on a long trip. Stuff breaks, it's a motorcycle. And I, for one, have really, really gotten my money's worth out of my cheap, add-on roadside assistance that I have through my insurance. Everyone has a different opinion about which company is best and everybody has their own horror stories about every single company out there, but Progressive has really treated me well. I haven't had to deal with any like proper accidents with my insurance yet. I did have one incident with my truck. I also have my truck insurance through Progressive and I have zero complaints about the process or how they handled it. It was really smooth and very not stressful, but I don't have any experience um, to speak to the way that they handle motorcycle incidents specifically. What I can speak to though is that I have saved over two grand in tow bills since getting roadside assistance with them. For example, I got towed from Butte to Anaconda because there's literally nobody who is qualified to work on Lazarus, so they had to take me wherever I wanted to go. <laughs> Another example that happened a lot more recently is that Progressive covered my tow from Blythe, California to Phoenix, Arizona because that was where the nearest Triumph dealership was. <laughs> that was 150 miles. Okay, for example, if I had to, had to pay that out of pocket, it would have been anywhere from $400 to $900. Enough said. Lesson number two, carrying a first aid kit isn't an option. It should be as important to you as carrying a tool roll for your bike. Hard truth, I didn't carry a legitimate first aid kit for the whole of the pilgrimage. All I had was a couple of band-aids and some ibuprofen. If you didn't know, I broke my wrist last year on the way to Rocky Mountain Roll, and shortly before the trip is the first time that I've ever bought like a proper first aid kit that had bandages and like wraps and all the good stuff. It is pretty much only because I had that kit with me that I was even able to ride out of the woods with a broken throttle wrist. We do an inherently dangerous thing riding motorcycles. It's a very common saying that it is not if you go down, it is when you go down. Especially, especially if you ride off-road. Dumping your bike is pretty much guaranteed if you ride dirt. <laughs> Not carrying a first aid kit, especially if you carry tools for your bike, is just dumb in my opinion. <laughs> That's me speaking as a person who's only carried a first aid kit on their bike since last year. I have been riding since 2011. It's a whole lot of dumb. <laughs> Lesson number three. Be very specific about the people that you choose to travel with. This one was definitely learned the hard way on my trip to Baja last year. There ended up being seven of us, which was just way too big of a group for that trip in general. And I did my best to hide it in the vlogs, but there were a couple people who went on that trip with us who were just really not my favorite people. That was just made worse by the sheer size of the group and also our complete and utter lack of ability to all come to a compromise properly. It took us absolutely forever to figure out what we were doing every single time we stopped. We missed out on half of the planned stops and campsites that we had made before we even left because a particular person in our group was too scared or decided last minute that they didn't want to camp that night, which is why we ended up in a hotel last minute that smelt like a toilet and another hotel that we stayed in last minute that cost twice as much as any other hotel that we stayed at in Baja. I don't know if you can tell, but I have a whole lot of pent up rage about that whole trip. <laughs> there was a lot of things that I really loved about Baja itself. The people seeing all the new things, that was so awesome. But um, 
I just have a lot of angry feelings every time that I think about that trip specifically. <laughs> I'm sure there will be a couple people in the comments just letting me know that I seem to be an angry person in general, which is true, which is the point of the lesson. I really shouldn't be traveling in a group that size because I am an angry person. I'm happy and it doesn't take me a whole lot to be happy, but on the other side of things, it doesn't take a whole lot to piss me off either. <laughs> Moral of the story, make sure that you actually like the people that you're going to be spending every single day with. A couple of bonus tips that I also learned the hard way from traveling in a group, set very clear expectations before you leave and be realistic about those expectations. That includes how long you're going to ride between breaks, how long you plan to take when you actually take those breaks, including gas stops, photo stops, that kind of stuff, how long you plan to stop for meals, because that could be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half to two hours, you know? Being realistic about those expectations is really important to a very happy group in general and everybody's expectations for the trip being met. And because we're not all in the same financial situation, it's really important to be very clear about your budgeting expectations before you leave on the trip, um, specifically about the kind of places that you want to stop and eat. If you want to do all of the attractions that cost a lot of money and also what your expectations for lodging are going to be, you know, budgeting to camp every night is a whole lot different than budgeting to stay in a hotel every night. Last but not least, this is very important, have designated signals or like road signs for emergencies and have a backup way to get in contact with each other if you get separated and there's no cell service. <laughs> Lesson number four, understand what you enjoy about travel and don't do something just because somebody else wants to. Another lesson that I thought that I had learned that smacked me in the face this year on the Falling Short series is really understanding what you like about travel and what you don't like about travel. It is so, so easy to get really caught up in the excitement um, that everybody else is feeling about a thing and forget what you need to be happy while you're on the road. <laughs> it can be a huge bummer to you and your travel mates if you get all excited to do the thing and then you get there and you're like, wait, no, I don't like this. <laughs> this is a whole lot different than compromise. Compromise is good. It gets you to push your comfort zones a little bit and kind of meet halfway. If somebody wants to do a thing and you want to do a different thing, meeting in the middle is a good thing. However, what I'm talking about is doing something way, way, way outside of your comfort zone. And it's just not good to the point of being dangerous. I let myself get way too caught up in the hype around the release of the Cabder. I was really just in love with the idea of doing the Cabder because all of my friends were so excited about the Cabder and were talking about how awesome it was going to be for months. Then I got there and I was in way, way over my head. I had to then actually think about what I enjoy about adventure riding and beating myself up to say that I did an obstacle or saying that I finished a BDR is not what I enjoy about adventure riding. <laughs> I really enjoy seeing new places and seeing pretty things. I'm not opposed to getting over an obstacle to get to the other side to see the pretty thing, but if I have to do an obstacle and there really isn't a payoff on the other side besides satisfaction that I got over the obstacle, I tend to feel a little deflated and uh, it ruins my mood. Pretty bad. <laughs> That's not to say that like the BDRs are awesome. I think the BDR Association is amazing. I just don't think that it's really for me. I've done little sections of the Idaho BDR, which is awesome. Maybe that's where it's at for me. Maybe I just do sections and that's my jam. The moral of this point is that you should really have a little sit down and be like, what do I actually enjoy about traveling? And focus on that, you know? It's important to like stretch your comfort zones, try other things every once in a while. It's important to also be very realistic about what you like about traveling and get the most out of it, you know? We only have so much time. Lesson number five, it is so important to document your trips, but not every trip needs to be filmed. Earlier this year, I had to make an unexpected trip back to Montana to go to a funeral because my grandmother passed away. If you watched the little two-parter in that series, you will know I had a hard time talking to the camera. My heart just really was not in it. And even when I tried to fix it when I got back, it just really made for subpar content because 
I was back here trying to put a happy face on, but the footage that I was using that I took on the trip really was reflecting how shitty of a mood that I was on that whole trip. <laughs> the point is that it's still important to take photos of the places that you stop because you're still going to want to remember those things or at the very least to journal your experiences so that you can vent your feelings, all that good stuff. But if you're not in the greatest headspace, there really isn't any point in you filming. This goes especially if you also have a blog like I do or if you make videos on YouTube and that kind of stuff. Not every single trip needs to be filmed. For one, no one wants to watch that. <laughs> Number two, it's also important for you to take time to yourself every once in a while. You know, motorcycling for a lot of us, it's also like therapy. Do trips for yourself and not for social media and give yourself time to process things that are going on in your life. Hope that you guys enjoyed this video about some lessons that I learned on the road in the last two years. Let me know down in the comments some lessons that you have learned on the road. If you like this content and would like to support my channel for as little as one dollar a month, you can get early access to videos like these on my Patreon. Links to that are down in the description. If that's not up your alley, that is totally okay. I do also have posters, stickers, t-shirts, prints, all the good things with my motorcycle art on them in my Redbubble shop. Link to that is also down in the description. If that is also not up your alley or you can't do that right now, that is totally okay. I appreciate you just for watching these videos. And in the meantime, guys, I'll see you later. You'd have a little sit down with yourself and be like, hey, in order to be happy, I need to sleep well every single night, whether that means staying in a hotel every night on your trip, or if that means camping in the middle of nowhere because you feel more comfortable when you're as far away from a city as humanly possible. <laughs> Whatever that means, you just need to have that conversation with yourself so that you have less trips that suck. <laughs> A couple of people have mentioned that they missed the garage. So here we are back in the garage. Here's Lazarus. I'm trying to get her running again. It has been a process. I think she's trying to get me to pay for the last year and a half or so that she's just been sitting in the garage. But hopefully in the near future, Lazarus will live again. In the meantime, I am not without things to do because uh, the 16K service needs to be done on Briarios and I'm not even gonna get into the list of things that are wrong with Astraeus right now. <laughs> I guess my main priority is to get the 16K service done on Briarios so that I can take him to Montana in September. Um, if you guys didn't see on my social media, I am going to Sony Alpha Camera Camp in September. I'm very excited. It's like a one day seminar thing that they're doing. I'm super stoked to have been accepted. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to share that experience with you guys. And then I will be making a return appearance to Babes Right Out this October, which I'm also very excited about. A uh, lot of new people that I get to meet there this year. And then November, I'll be going somewhere for my birthday. I don't know where yet. Probably not very far because I probably won't have very much money left after September and October. <laughs>